good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and welcome to the panel on regional media. media. Uh, let me start by saying a few words, and then uh, I would uh, introduce our distinguished guests, and then we can hear from them about the topic that we are covering today. Uh, well, it goes without saying that we are living in the age of communications in today's world, traditional media, uh, such as radio, TV, and cable networks transcend national boundaries and target audience all around the globe. However, the modern communication tools like social media has revolutionized the flow of information and public interactions. In the past, lack of access to information was a major challenge. It is still in some uh, societies. But in the present day world, more generally, too much of accessibility and availability is also becoming a challenge, both for media and for the audience. Being exposed to a world of communication tools makes it easier for audience to pick the content of their choice. But having too many choices also creates lots of confusion for audience. It also exposes them to a lot of fake or unauthenticated news and uh, content. It's also becoming increasingly challenging for independent media to stay focused on a single target audience. That said, traditional media, especially local channels, are still not out of the game people still turn to their local media outlets for serious news and current affairs. People still tune into more credible source of information, no matter what part of the world it originates from, to get access to the truth. But to preserve that trend, we require more robust media outlets with a specific focus, with targeted outreach, and with objective approach. Media outlets need to be proactive and adapt to the changing environment. And that principle can apply to the Kamka region as well. If our countries want to boost connectivity and cooperation at a strategic level, we will obviously need to improve our communications and interaction. And for that, we need media with more regional focus and agenda. Media that produces content with a wider region that a wider region, regional audience can easily relate to. So Kamka Network is definitely one of the best suited organizations to explore this option, and that's why we're today here discussing this issue. So the questions that we will explore today is, can we have a regional media? If yes, how can it be built? And what will a Kamka region's voice look like? Our distinguished panelists will discuss and answer these questions. I would start by introducing Mr. Anders Wembush, uh, President of Estrada Various, uh, Ms. Nargiza Babamradov, Head of International Department at the National Association of Electronic Media here in Uzbekistan. To my right, uh, I have Mr. Jargal Dambadarja, Editor-in-Chief of De Facto Gazette. Did I pronounce the name correctly, I hope? Uh, I have Mr. John Batchelor, host of uh, The John Batchelor Show. Last but not least, my very close and lovely friend, uh, Najib Sharifi, Director of Rumi Media Consulting in Afghanistan. Uh, I would start with Mr. Wembush. Uh, you, you have a lot of experience with media. You have been... Um, you had, had been running uh, Radio Free Europe, or Radio Liberty as we call it in Afghanistan, and you also know uh, the region a lot. If you tell us how this issue can be, regional media issue can be approached, and if you run us through different stages of the possibility of building a regional media. Thank you, Barry. Can I steal your microphone? Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Thanks for that very uh, astute uh, introduction. I think it sets the scene exactly right. Uh, 
I've had a lot of experience out here. Uh, we built some of the first uh, media outlets around Central Asia, and I personally was responsible for building the first Radio Free, Free Afghanistan, which was wow. a lot of fun way back then. Um, I, when, I, when I tried to answer this question, can there be regional media, the answer to me seemed to be yes, of course there can be regional media, but there are a whole bunch of very important questions that one has to answer before you can actually uh, move forward and set it up. And I made myself a checklist of about six or seven things and I will just go down it right, uh, right now. One, what's the mission? Uh, what do you want to achieve? What's your value proposition? Is it profit making, public service, a political voice? Is it a vanity project, brand equity project, entertainment? Is it about them or is it about us? Are you satisfying a demand or are you creating a demand? What would success look like? Two, what does the competition look like? Uh, are there regional media? What do they do? Uh, this takes place, as you mentioned very correctly, in, a, in an environment that is media rich. Think about the internet. What's your niche? Three, what are the platforms or platform? TV, where most people get their information, radio, internet, social media, podcasting, mobile content, print. What means? Satellite, placement on existing platforms, Content producer with affiliations or subscribers, multi-platform approach. A multi-platform approach is very, very attractive, but it's expensive, regardless if you create separate divisions or distribute the same content to all the different platforms. This requires multi-platform producers, journalists, technicians, and all the other things that go along with it. Four, what audience are you trying to attract? Everyone, youth, elites, masses, business people, students, intellectuals, activists, and political actors. If you don't know the answer to that question, you can't create any medium. Five, what's the content? News, international, national, regional, community, long, short, investigative, specialized, financial, political, cultural programming, features, analysis and context, educational, original content, or repackaging existing content. All require different approaches, different platforms, different, uh, and, and respond to the mission in different ways. Six, and very important for regional media out here, what formats and what languages how do you gather the information? Crowdsourcing? What makes it regional? Are there common thematic points, uh, points of, of view, common audiences, and so forth? And finally, uh, my seventh is what I call my other challenges. Do you have enough money? Can you sustain it? What are the sources of your revenue to make it work? What do you have that others can steal? Politics, how do you figure those in? Regulatory agencies and conventions, who regulates regional media across multiple national jurisdictions? Management and training, who is going to train all of the people you need to make this work? Where do you find the personnel? Very important, how do you measure success? Is it your revenue stream, your audience size, the buzz you create? How do you ensure quality control? There are seven points that I would think need to be addressed before you can get to the real question, which is can there be regional media? I think the answer probably is yes, there can be regional media. But if you can't answer those questions, you're not going to have a media that's focused on anything useful and is sustainable over the long term. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I would ask uh, Nargiza to think about some of those components. Uh, we will get back to you later. Uh, whether we do have, uh, you know, uh, worked on those aspects of, you know, uh, 
looking into building a regional media. But I would ask, yes, uh, I would ask Mr. Dambadarja, uh, who is uh, running a multimedia company in six languages and is already involved in some sort of uh, regional content production, not in the, uh, at the Central Asian level, but in different languages like Japanese, Chinese, and Korean. If you could, sir, uh, tell us uh, about your experience running the de facto multimedia company and how uh, your audience has responded to regional content production, whether it's worked for you or not. Thank you, Barry. I would follow the line Mr. Wimpush just suggested, as I find it very logical, and is I was asking exactly the same questions 10 years before I started this work. I'm a, before I want to tell you one thing, it's only a chance for me to address my Uzbek friends. I, I was studying Russian language in this city more than 40 years ago. And I had a wonderful teachers, Uzbeks, whom I rem uh, rem remember for all my life. And um, I'm very thankful to the Uzbek people, to the hospitality extended that time to many of us. I went to the place, and the street is changed. Name is completely different. Area is also. But the building was the same. I saw that from the back. How was it? And we were playing basketball in the backyard, etc. So great memories. And I was, I was so happy to see the Tashkent as hospitable as before, as green as before. So that's a good chance for me to say thank you to Uzbek people. Uh, on what I do following this line, uh, I studied in Moscow. I graduated from Moscow State University. Then I met my MBA in University of Denver, Colorado. And I'm a banker, actually, by profession. I was a CEO of Commercial Bank. And then I started to write. I had to, because for development, for any progress, you need straightforward communications, which is to be very short, concise, and attractive in this time of the information, uh, a lot of avalanche, I would say. So with this demand, I want to create this demand, because there were so many information sources all around the world, including Mongolia, with all this mob mobile phone, everything. So you need to be different. That's what I started. How I can be different? I can make analysis. Analysis from a particular point of view. In this case, in Mongolia, I tried to make this analysis from democracy, human rights, and free market, which I think basis of prosperity. And unfortunately, some countries are still ahead of all these roads. Because early 90s, in spite of our small population, three million in between two giants, I think we made possible one thing, which communism did not give. That is the feeling of private property. We privatized. Yes, there were some mistakes. But the people got the sense of property, which made them to protect it under anything. And then that we had the first trading companies. And in fact, the current president of Mongolia was one of the traders. He was buying video camera in Singapore, with whom we had no visa. He was asking a friend, why I can go with this visa, with this passport? They just obtained, because like in Uzbekistan a few years ago, we had exit visa, my friends, which was coming with the passport. And that president went to Singapore, he made big money selling videos to Russia, and he's present today. Not because he's money. But however, so in that country, we need some very concise information from these three points of view just I described. So I was writing now, and since that, and I start right after two years, my employer asked me, Jargal, you do either your financial business for me or you write. 
So I selected to be a writer. And I promised myself to do it for 10 years. I will write it every week. I will not miss. And good news, in two weeks I have my 10th year, and I have not missed a week. Thank you. Because now, once you have education, not everybody had the privilege I have, though I am from a very middle-class family. Now you share your analysis. That's where I come from. And how? There were media. By the way, in Mongolia, we have one of the other things we made. We made state having no media. Mongolian government has no media. We have only public media, which is consisting of the boards from NGO and other people. Yes, there is impact, but not as before. So for success of the country, for that, you need communication of free people. You need freedom of speech, complete and unconditional. Without that, this free communication don't go. Without free communication, there is no understanding. No understanding, no trust. No trust, no business. That's what it's about, I think, I thought. So uh, that's why I was keep uh, moving. And just in a second, I, I went. Then the only thing was mobile phone. So you, whatever you put, put on website, application, and support by social media, which gave great opportunity to everybody everywhere. So as a result, I have now 200,000 Twitter followers, 57,000 Facebook. And with my one comment, I outreach whole country. So then the, it is the best defense for me from anybody who is opposing my points. I can go after the details. Thank Thanks. you so much. Uh, Thanks a lot. Uh, Mr. Damodarja. Uh, now, Nargiza, I would like to turn to you to talk about the opportunities that exist right now. Uh, Najib would be talking about challenges, but uh, I want to tie this two uh, uh, presentations together, see where opportunities are and where challenges are and how they could be overcome. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much, Fatia, for giving me an opportunity to speak to, uh, to tell you about our experience, uh, which we are facing in Uzbekistan. Uh, first of all, let me introduce our association. So the National Association of Electronic Mass Media of Uzbekistan was founded uh, 15 years ago when I was a child and was not thinking about my career here yet, but still, it was uh, founded by 50 producers of non-governmental TV and radio broadcasters. And uh, today, the association unites more than 100 non-governmental TV and radio stations and cable studios. And uh, NAEM carries out a number of projects aimed at enhancing the civil position of its employees, of uh, non-governmental TV and radio station staff. So, uh, however, our main task remains that the creation of a civilized media market based on equal rights, equal rights between governmental TV channels and non-governmental ones. So uh, we are trying to achieve the healthy mutual competition between them. So the economic component of the country's television and radio studios enhance the degree of their activity and participation in the processes of social and political life directly depends on how media market develops. So that's why our association uh, was trying to achieve that equal conditions for all. And uh, I want to note uh, some of the changes that are happening today. Uh, for example, in 2017, for Uzbekistan was the year of major changes in the history of television and radio broadcasters. Because in one year, four private TV channels opened at once. And uh, they are the TV channels like Milli TV, Zor TV, Seunli, and Football TV channels. Nevertheless, to get the audience, each channel has started to work to achieve their own niches in the market. So now Uzripur TV channel is the news channel. Seumli TV is the family channel. Zor TV is an, uh, chosen the entertainment direction. Milli TV is the channel aimed at preserving national traditions. My5 is a youth channel. So as you see, every channel has its own audience. 
But still, uh, working with our association, we consolidate our efforts on exchange of content, exchange of uh, experience, and exchange of stuff. And um, these positive changes uh, are very significant for the development of the media. And the initiator of these historical and large-scale changes is the President Shavkat Mirziyoyev, who sets a new vector, who sets a new direction of state policy in the freedom of speech and information. He notes, first of all, our focus should be on such important issues as improving the efficiency of the media, turning them into a free platform for dialogue with people, forming a modern market for information services and healthy competitive environment. So at this stage of country's development, especially on the media sphere, now we have no barriers to uh, start the cooperation with the international partners. Yes, we had the international cooperation before also, but now it's growing day by day and we are starting a lot of uh, beneficial, mutually beneficial projects with our partners. For example, uh, for the last year, we had a project with the BBC Media Action, UNESCO office in Tashkent, and the British Embassy here in Uzbekistan on enhancing the skills of the journalists and the technical staff on non-governmental TV channels. So for the one year, we have conducted 10 training workshops uh, with the experts of the BBC Academy. And I can tell the results were great because uh, it is a great opportunity for our colleagues uh, in order to learn from the experienced, well-experienced BBC journalists to, uh, on how making uh, news programs, on how making uh, entertainment programs, and even how making uh, socially significant programs. So, um, I can list a large part of our partners, like the Condor Tan, our foundation, who is helping us uh, every year on making uh, exchange programs, on making exchange of content, on enhancing the skills of the um, journalists and the technical stuff. So now we have the full conditions in order to expand our regional cooperation. And um, in order to produce media projects that are successful to the region, we need to find the overall pattern or mold of successful projects and media content and seek for the common factors. From there, we should try to leverage on the learned concepts and develop joint projects that reflect, reflect our reality or the reality we aspire to. So this is the common business approach. And as um, our colleague, Mr. Wimbush told, it is very important to set the right questions and to find the best solutions for them. And in order to make that, we are happy and open uh, for cooperation, and I think it is very important for us to consolidate our efforts in Central Asian region, because the development of each other is like dependent to each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we will get back to you on uh, what can be done given the, the experience that uh, you have uh, right now and the level of cooperation that already exists there. Uh, uh, Najib, could you uh, talk to us a little bit about the challenges and barriers that you feel exist uh, to uh, cooperation, media cooperation at regional level, given that you're uh, involved extensively in media production, but you have also had a lot of uh, interactions globally with different institutions, uh, uh, but also uh, you come from a country uh, where uh, it's the center of the focus at the moment and uh, one of the main goals of the current, for example, go government is to uh, establish more connectivity and cooperation at regional level. W where does, for example, a country like Afghanistan factor in? in that kind of a scheme. Uh, thank you very much, Barry, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, um, I think there are some really fundamental, barri uh, fundamental barriers um, against regional media and regional cooperation in the realm of media. Um, I just want to point out to one story. Um, um, I think that can highlight the gravity of the issue. In 2014, I was in a conference in Bishkek. It was about media and terrorism. Um, we had um, journalists from all over Central Asia. Um, so throughout the you know, discussion, 
the uh, journalists from Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan didn't even speak one word. Uh, so after the session, I went to them and I said, like, so why, why don't you guys take, didn't you take part in the discussion? Well, they told me that <laughs> we're a little bit scared, you know. <laughs> so it was there that I uh, realized, um, um, you know, how big of an issue or how big of a challenge it is. Um, we operate in a region where, based on the ranking of Reporter Sans Frontier, which is based in Paris, um, some Central Asian countries, actually most of them, fall in the worst position in terms of press freedom. For instance, so RSF each year, you know, they rank, um, basically they work with like 180 countries and they rank each country based on the level of press freedom they have. Um, Turkmenistan is in the worst in the world. The ranking is 180. So, um, Uzbekistan is 160. Tajikistan is 161. Kazakhstan 158. Azerbaijan 166. Well, we, we, we in Afghanistan are in a much better position, actually. We are 121. Um, so the only country in Central Asia, you know, apart from Afghanistan, uh, which has got a more liberal environment for press freedom is Kyrgyzstan, which, um, whose ranking is 83. So operating in such an environment, I believe it's extremely, extremely difficult to um, uh, realize that aspiration that we have in terms of you know, um, securing cooperation between the media in the region. That's the biggest challenge. And I believe, you know, the countries, we're so glad, you know, countries like Uzbekistan are trying to liberalize, you know, the environment, but media freedom has to be part of that package. Because without that, I don't think we will be able to achieve that goal in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an effective way. Uh, because as you rightly said, you know, people need to know about each other. You know, countries need to know about what's going on. For example, we in Afghanistan, the audiences would love to know what's going on in Uzbekistan, both in terms of culture, in terms of like, you know, uh, people's lifestyle, in terms of trade, in terms of economic opportunities, and anything that falls in that line. Um, so that's challenge number one. Now, challenge number two, um, it's um, we have to be extremely creative, even if we liberalize you know, the environment for press freedom in terms of creating demand for the audiences. Um, how we do that, that's a su subject of deep question, I mean discussion, but um, media at the end of the day, media outlets are slaves to their audiences. You know? So they have to produce content that entertains their audiences. Otherwise, you know, so the audiences in, the, in today's world, you know, where they have access to probably like 100 channels, they can easily switch channels. So that's why from a media perspective or from, from the perspective of somebody who's you know, managing a media, they have to be able to create the kind of content you know, that's appealing to their audiences. Will we be able to do that? We can, but we have to be extremely creative and we have to find that kind of like overarching topic or theme that appeals to audiences in, the, in this region could be culture, it could be entertainment, it could be like economy, it could be you know investment opportunities, um, or anything else. Um, um, the third barrier, um, I, I mean, I'm glad that Wim also mentioned it, is the finance. You know, the, the will the media outlets be able to, um, you know, finance programs or let's say reporters, for example, in an ideal world, we, need, we in Afghanistan need to have, Tolo TV, which is the biggest TV station in Afghanistan, needs to have a base in Tashkent, you know, at an office. Or the biggest TV station in Uzbekistan, you know, um, I don't know the name, but it, they, they have to have a bureau in Kabul, for instance, or a bureau in, you know, Bishkek or, or Dushanbe or somewhere else. Will they be able to do that, you know, and, if, and what, how they can secure the finances for that. 
who is running a show that I believe comes out of uh, the New York City, but it has a global reach and appeal, as uh, I spoke to you, sir, yesterday. Uh, so I would turn to you now, if you could uh, talk to us about how to attract audience uh, uh, in, in, different, uh, in different ways, at different parts of the world using a, even a local show and how could we possibly address uh, some of the barriers that Najib uh, uh, discussed and what would your recommendations be? Because uh, yes, there are barriers, but there are also creative ways that we can address that. From your experience, uh, well, we want to learn here. Sure, thank you very much. I'm a commercial radio broadcaster. I do the news. And in America, news is very big, and it makes a whole lot of money. Americans love to argue about the news. We love it. And I'm going to guess, so does everybody else. Uh, I'm also going to guess everybody else thinks that America has this power and reach. Well, we're as parochial as you are. We talk about around the corner or the awful subways. However, once in a while, we address subjects on the other side of the world where we find awful subways. But at the same time, we find good stories. And my measure, and now I've been in Central Asia in my life, a week in Alma Alta in 2003 during the invasion of Iraq. It was a dark period. And now several days in Tashkent, and I've been in and out of the Caucasus these last years. So my experience is very narrow. What I've learned, however, is your regional story is a whopper. You've got it. You're boomtown, 21st century. You're going to do nothing but get rich. And America loves that story because we did it. We didn't have anything different than you do. A bunch of cranky people at odds with each other from everywhere in the world. And they showed up and fought for several centuries, and now we're rich. OK, is there a formula there? I don't think so. But there's a good story, and you've got one. What I see in Tashkent, and let's go to Baku. What do I see in Baku when I'm there? Building towers. Building towers. The same building towers I see in Washington, D.C. That tells me the money's coming. So here in Tashkent, in Tashkent, I see walls going up because you're doing building. You're, building new, you're replacing the creative geniuses of the Soviet Empire's idea of residence. You're replacing them with what we live in in America, which is prefab housing. It's fabulous, got good plumbing. That's a great story. The other great story is that you exist. America doesn't know you're here. You've got this enormous audience in America. We think, Central Asia, where's that? And then we go, Afghanistan, everybody hangs their head. That's it, that's it, right. So could my, my audience find Kyrgyzstan on a map? No, neither could I, unless I get a head start. When I talk to my audience and I say, I'm in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, the weather's better than San Diego. They have no idea whether I'm making it up or not. It happens to be true, but they don't know that. They'll go with the story. And when I tell them that there are young people here who are ambitious and want to grow, to be up and up so they're just like Tennessee, which is low taxes, all right, they, leave, they believe me. Well, it happens to also be true. So regional news, which, by the way, includes sport. That sells. Weddings. Boy, does that sell. So does fashion. So does TV criticism. Regional news is a winner. I do regional news in New York. Everybody thinks I'm talking about the planet. No, I'm talking about what New York makes money doing. That's what I'm talking about. So what I, want, what I heard on this panel today, nothing but good stories. Nothing. And what has America had for, I've been reporting on the war since the attack on New York. What have we had about this part of the world for 18, is it 18 years now, Andrews? Yes, 18 years now. We've had nothing but violence and tragedy, a total falsehood, total falsehood. Yeah, you can find violence somewhere in Afghanistan or somewhere in Pakistan, but boy, you have to look for it when you look how big everything is and how many people there are. You can find violence in New York City. I can find it on 34th Street if I look for it. 
But that isn't what the world thinks. The world thinks that on 34th Street, people are getting rich. Well, they are, and you are too. So what I've learned in these few days, and I said, this is not a wide experience. What I've learned is that we get it if you tell it. People get married, people build businesses, people become successes. We have a saying in America, it's from the 19th century, you're not really rich until you've lost two fortunes on Wall Street, all right? So I think that works here too. You're not really rich until you've, you've, you've messed up twice trying to be rich. And that story, once upon a time, yes, you've got different names, but so do I. I have a different name, okay, once upon a time, a different name. And if you tell that story and you put it on this, it'll find its audience. Uh, I tell a story every night for four hours, five nights a week. I have for 18 years. And then I turned it into a podcast, which I highly recommend for all your products. I recommend you all podcasts. You speak very good English and you tell stories. You turned it into a podcast. You put the podcast out. You don't know where your audience is. Don't be presumptive. I do 5.4 million downloads a month. And I can see they go to Tokyo. I can see they go to Moscow. I can see they go to South Africa. I don't know who they are. It's not up to you to presume who your audience is. Just put it out there. And if you tell a good story, they'll find you. We have this, I'll end with this. We have this great movie quote from the 1970s. Build it and they will come. And that works for regional media because there is no other kind. And I want you to make money. I don't want this to be sacrifice, okay? Another thought I've had, but I'll just end with this. Another thought I had is, you think America's press is free? That's funny. <laughs> you, think, you, think, you think we're not divided into camps at war with each other, calling each other liars? That's funny, that's funny. But in any event, okay, we got a freedom of the press. Um, I want you to make money. And I think the fastest way to make money right now is to start talking about the World Cup. Man, can you sell that? And you've got the Asia Cup, you can sell that too. Never forget, in America, what works is sports reporting. That's what works. I'm a subset of sports reporting. I'm not the thing that they, they, they're not a subset of me. So I'm sure you have sports in Afghanistan. I know you have sports in Uzbekistan. Tell that story and they'll show up. And then, then you can sell them anything. I'll end with that. Sell them anything. I want you to make money. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Bachelor, for that uh, motivating uh, speech. I think uh, you give us the, the hope that it's possible. So uh, let's work with that spirit. And there's some uh, major issues raised here um, that even if we, we could have a regional media, how it would look like, what kind of audience we're, we're trying to target, what kind of reach we want to have, what kind of uh, 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 themes and topics we can focus on, and uh, how could we overcome the political barriers, for example, and financial barriers. I'd like to uh, open, up, open it up to you if you have some questions and contributions to make here and ask our panelists the, the relevant questions so that we could explore a little bit further these topics. Uh, thank you. <coughs> My name is Shah Ibrahim. I'm from Afghanistan. I'd like to make uh, two observations and, and present a question to the panel uh, for all the panelists, whoever is interested in answering. Uh, first of all, before joining this session, I did a quick walkthrough. The other two rooms were full. This room is not. And then I looked at the topic and then I said, oh, okay. And that goes to my uh, first observation, which is I'd like to address the elephant in the room. Um, I work in the public sector in Afghanistan. I've worked very senior government positions um, in my country. I was, the, I was the acting mayor of Kabul, the capital, for a while. And in Afghanistan, media keeps power in check. The government is careful with the media. You just can't do anything you want because you know somebody out there will come after you and shame you and name you and give you a really hard time and give you stress when you sleep at night. And I guess the reason 
um, why people are having a bit of a tough time addressing this question is because um, media is very powerful. And that's perhaps what the establishments are trying to process and trying to digest. So the question I have to the panel is, do you think we can have a regional media independent of the power relation with the government? Make it a sports slash entertainment slash anything non-political, but give it a regional, like a regional Eurovision or a Kamka Vision dance competition or something. Do you think it can be independent from power? Or do you think we need to be a bit more realistic and expect a regional media only when the powers that be in the region develop the stomach for it and develop the appetite for opening up? Thank you. I'll just add something here because it's relevant that when we leave things to the government, sometimes it doesn't work. There was a venture by the three governments of Iran, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan to have the first Persian uh, regional media, but it didn't work. Uh, so I would uh, uh, put it to you, sir, and also I would uh, want to get Mr. Dambadarja's view later on this topic. Yeah, thank you. That's a very, it's a very good question, uh, and it hooks together with some other things that have been said both at both ends of the table, Mr. Sharafi and, and, uh, and John Batchelor, it's, it's absolutely the case that there's very little press freedom, very little media freedom uh, in, in this region. And that's going to linger for a long time. Uh, there's, that residue is not going to be quick to, uh, to disintegrate. It's going to stay here. I mean, we've seen this across all the post-Soviet states with very few exceptions. That, that it just it, it hang on, hangs on and hangs on and hangs on, which is, of course is because uh, in the, during the Soviet period you were taught, as Lenin used to say, if I could control the movie theaters, I can control the population. And media has a, has a terribly, uh, a terribly um, uh, controlling aspect in, in those kinds of politics. So it's not gonna go away quickly. I think Mr. Sharafi is absolutely right. It's gonna take some time to do, but, as John Batchelor said, you know, sports sells. I think that it's entirely possible to have a regional media of non-controversial, acceptable uh, subjects, and maybe that's the place to start. I mean, maybe the place, if, if there's an uh, entrepreneurial group here that says, let's put together a, uh, a regional media team, the first task should be, what things can we actually talk about that are not going to generate opposition from the governments or the, or the vested interests. I mean, not easy, but it's, there certainly are plenty of things that, that, that are possible. And start with that. Get, a, get a, a nose under the tent with that, and perhaps that evolves uh, little by little. It simply is not going to be the case that uh, tomorrow you're going to get Fox News uh, in in this region, it just isn't going to happen. So uh, some some smaller steps, but I think there are some absolutely acceptable areas that you could do regional media. Uh, as John Batchelor said storytelling of all kinds. Tell your own story uh, and tell it to each other, uh, which would be informative for your whole audience. Be, I think I think it's entirely possible. I agree with Najib about having a complete freedom. Without the complete freedom, interesting. You talk half truth. So uh, what I started from the beginning was with a fight with our capital city mayor, who was giving permission land without any tender. And I started to name these places and start coming out. This land is given to somebody that we don't know why. Tell us. On social media, I started. So very good platform now to start is Twitter, Facebook, etc. Then you can combine it into media, so for letter references of the things. But the most important thing is your mission. What you want really to do. We fight corruption, first of all, in these countries. 
that with the corruption, nothing is moving. So you find that particular topic you are, then the people will know and then will follow. That's, I suggest, for every country to do. But at the regional level, I think security issue. China, Pakistan, Tajikistan, I understand, and four countries recently created new security alliances. Why? Why the Americans and the Russians take one by one the airport in Kyrgyzstan? What's behind? You just go, you don't assume that everybody understands, but go very, in very simple words, less than 100 words, explain. Then you grow and grow, and then your, every tweet will be listening. This is the way I think to but start. But that's already happening, isn't it? Uh, I'll take your question and then I'll get to you now, guess, about this. My name is uh, from Mongolia. I'm a professional journalist, and that's why I'm really interested into this topic. And I totally agree with all you said about this regional media. Uh, but uh, let's face the reality. You know, our uh, uh, freedom of press index is just totally different from each other. Like Mongolia, I think the Mongolia in this region is the, the highest uh, freedom we have. Uh, Mr. Jargal said that he has uh, over 200,000 Twitter followers, right? But the, the, the biggest daily newspaper in Mongolia, the daily circulation is only less than 10,000 copies. So just think about it. The traditional media is really actually just dying down. And then electronic media, digital media is taking place. And the people are tend to listen more like reliable sources, reliable people. That's why they're actually uh, uh, supporting the people like uh, Mr. Jarga. Another issue is that uh, we need to uh, face the reality is that what about the religion? It is very uncomfortable topic for many countries, for all, all of us. How much, yes, it is not, could be non-political, total entertainment and sports. Uh, what about religion? I'm not saying that religion is bad, but we need to, uh, in order to understand each other, we have to talk about religion. We have to actually just make sense to each other. So that's why the, the, the other the countries could accept they what really actually just they believe in. So that's just my thought. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Diljan, and I'm from Kazakhstan, public policy expert. And I just have a brief question and maybe comment. Uh, so um, how do you think, uh, is there any possibility to uh, establish a special uh, platform which will uh, facilitate uh, the regional media dialogue uh, like in Kazakhstan, we have uh, Eurasian Media Forum uh, that is held uh, annually in Almaty and Astana, but it more covers cover, uh, covers um, international world issues. But uh, if we, for example, do something in, like a specific Central Asian regional media forum uh, that will target uh, the media development, perhaps it could be under the Kamka umbrella. Maybe this is a proposition, or maybe your thoughts can be, um, I'll be more uh, than happy to hear. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I would put this question to Nargiza because you're already working with <coughs> the associations. Do you think Kamka would be a good platform, or there should be more involvement uh, from civil society organizations and associations, uh, media and uh, journalist associations of different countries to come together and for such a cooperation. Bring, you know, start a platform, set up a platform where this regional media initiative could be taken forward. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I just, uh, I just want to add one important thing for us, uh, which we have seen from our experience. Um, you know, uh, when we are working with our international partners like BBC, Uzbek, like Deutsche Welle, the, the others, other documentary companies, for example, it is uh, interesting for the global audience to hear from this country, not from the local organization, 
but from the outside organizations. For example, when we are talking about ourselves, uh, it, it looks like that we are telling about only our positive sides and we do not, we are like, hmm, we are ashamed to tell about our negative sides. But still, when uh, we are doing joint projects with our international partners, when they are telling about the changes that we face now, and when they are telling about the problems that, that we are uh, facing now, it is working, it's working. I'm sorry. It's working better. And uh, as our colleagues already mentioned, we could start the regional, uh, regional media work uh, not only with the political part, which is very, um, which is very difficult to start in um, recent time, but uh, for example, in our association, we have the project named Cultural Legacy of Uzbekistan in the Meetings of the World. This project is aimed to study, to preserve, to identify the legacy of the Central Asian countries that are now stored in the different museums of the world. And we have already published 20 book albums and the documentaries for each of them. And it uh, is being very popular for these three years because uh, it is our common history. The legacy of Uzbekistan is not the legacy of only this country, but it is the like, legacy of the whole world. So we have the history that is interrelated to each, each other. For example, we could, um, it, it is an example that we could start working on the, our historical um, like cultural legacy issues uh, in, order to, um, in order to know about each other well, about our common history, about how it was interrelated, because now it is like getting uh, forgotten that we were the one land, we, were, we had the one history. So, we could start with uh, our joint work, regional media work, with such kind of a topics. Thank you. Is there any question? One more question we will take and then slowly close. Okay. Hello, speakers and attendants. My name is Jenny from the Kyrgyz Republic. Actually, yesterday I just um, gave the interview to Mr. John. Uh, it was a very awesome experience. Um, I just joined the second half of the panel, so I don't know if you have covered I'm mainly working in the education sector, so mainly deal with the school kids and student uni uh, university kids. My question, now we are talking a lot about this uh, financial literacy and so on, but uh, is there any very uh, good evidence-based educational programs where you teach the kids to have media literacy? because it is very important for them to have critical thinking, uh, to how to recognize the fake news, real news, and so on. So if there's any good educational uh, program related to this, which is targeting kids, uh, I would love to hear your experience. And a quick follow-up, it is, um, we are also talking a lot about media influencers. Those are people like on Instagram who have more than a million of kind of subscribers. However, in our region, I realize a lot of young people or millionaire generation, they're following those so-called like public figure or influencer. Um, they don't really like, um, they're more like a popularist or more or less. But how we can engage the young people also to subscribe this kind of, um, how to say, more serious or more professional, this kind of public figures through social media. I don't know if it is possible or it is just a trend going on like this. Thank you. Thank you, John. You want to, uh, on the role of education, educational content, you know, we're talking about what, how to approach this with what type of content that's less controversial, more attractive, and educational content is one, one type. Right. Uh, the, the seventh most powerful human being on earth is the person in charge of the teachers union in the United States of America. Okay? Mm -hmm. Bye. Our teachers are extremely powerful. They run one political party and they intimidate the other one. So what I've discovered whenever I do an education piece, and I often think I do these things just because they're so, con you know, they're, they're so difficult for me because I'm not an educator. I don't have any skills for teaching. And I was a good student, but I didn't learn anything from 
my professors about how to conduct myself. However, when I do an education piece, anything, a think tank, a new poll, discovery of a, of a trend in a curriculum, there's a huge audience for it. Who knows why? And you can't presume who they are. So what I know about education is that it sells. It shouldn't, to my mind. You know, what I care about is baseball, but education sells. And that, maybe it's controversial some way, because did you know one out of three members of the delegations to the Democratic National Convention are teachers? Did you know that? That's how powerful they are in the United States. When we nominate a Democratic candidate for the presidency, it's the teachers who nominate. That's what they, and it's their money. So I'm going to presume it's the same for you, for all of your cultures. Your teachers are very powerful. And people care about them. So what I would say to you is, talk to the teachers and tell the teachers to talk about education, to talk about what they're doing. Moms love it. Teenagers love it to talk to them about it. And even though you think it's dry and not particularly politically astute, you know, it's not about power. It's a good topic. And I, I think it will work for you. Uh, don't be defensive about it. For example, one example in, uh, that came up when I did a piece about this, one example is this. Online teaching. It didn't work in the US. It didn't. didn't. Why? No eye contact. Right? Human beings like eye contact. They, they respond to it. Your eyes give away your soul. Your soul tells whether you're serious or not, whether you're frightened or not, whether you care about the person you're talking to. So online failed everywhere in the United States. That's a hot topic because, boy, there's a lot of money in it. So I'm going to guess here because you have distances. Online would be attractive, but it doesn't work, especially for learning disabled children who need the teacher to face them. Even a teacher who turns his or her back, I did a piece on this, turns his or her back to write on a board, they lose the child. And maybe it's not the majority of children, but it's the ones who need the most attention from the teacher. And it's who the teachers are most thrilled to help. So those topics are exciting. They're exciting in Baltimore, they're going to be exciting in Bishkek. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we're almost the time is up. I'll give F, uh, every panelist 30 seconds to uh, <laughs> say what would be given the challenges and opportunities that exist. Uh, the, uh, the first uh, few steps, uh, one or two steps that we could take uh, taking this <coughs> initiative forward. Well, uh, the, uh, let, let me, uh, I'll get right to that one, but I, I just want to say one thing about educational programming. Uh, and, and it's because I failed miserably to be able to carry this out. When, when I was on the America's Broadcasting Board of Governors, I tried to get our networks, the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, I tried to get them to do basic business programming. How do you create a business? What are business ethics? How do you do proper accounting procedures? All of the sorts of things that young entrepreneurs need to get them going. I still think that that would be a very, very hot topic out here and it wouldn't be particularly controversial. And Comca just reinforces that, that belief, so that. What would you, where do you start? Uh, start with a strategic plan. I mean, there's no, nothing, don't just try to throw something up, sit down and plan it out. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, um, the, back to the question I would like to reflect on the Euro-Asia media. So far only media uh, network in this region. I was there two, three weeks ago in Almata. What was my take was these countries, I just started to talk. Remember three, four years ago, these countries had them, um, uh, mines, uh, the explosives on the line of their borders, the people start to talk. I let them talk. And I think Kamka is a great network where the NGOs work on topics. Then, and we call it, instead of media, we can call it com communication or dialogue in the region. Because now politicians start to talk, but not the people. 
Let the people talk. That's what it's about. Then it will be network. Why? Because if people don't understand each other, trust building. Politicians, they are changing. In some countries, even the guy has not changed for years, but however, in general, democracy suggests you are changed every four years. So they come and out, the people not. Let them have this network. Um, I just want to tell that uh, maybe we should think of the creation of the unique uh, platform on exchange of content between the Central Asian countries. Uh, because we have the common stories, we have the interesting stories that could be uh, like interesting uh, equally for Kazakhstan, for Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan and others. We should think of on making the platform TV, maybe TV platform on sharing of content. So. Thank you. Oh, well, before answering your question, I just want to brief touch upon that lady's uh, question about fake news and children. Oh, I think she's not here. Um, I, I, I think I'm, I, I do not favor the idea of like teaching those stuff to kids because they're extremely complex. We, have, we actually need to teach them to actual practicing journalists because the amount of fake news that's floating on the internet a lot of times, you know, basically confuses the journalists themselves and, and misguides them. So. And the uh, amount is increasing, unfortunately. Um, um, as for um, your question, I believe it's possible, but we have to ex be extremely cautious and strategic about it. In my view, it's, we can start by strictly sticking to production of entertainment content. Um, we have a show in um, um, one of the, I mean, the leading TV station in Afghanistan, Tolo TV, called I Maidan, Tai Maidan. And there was a, this, this kind of like young kid, you know, who travels to different countries with his car, you know, and uh, a buddy, and just uh, stops half the way and says like, oh, we have a bridge here, or they, they eat, for, or for example, like they put this much oil in their rice, you know, so <laughs> these, are kind, these kinds of content is very entertaining. Uh, for the audiences and in the later stages, you know, if things open up in the desired way, then we can go about more serious political and security discussions. But at this stage, I think that's the alarm button. So if we touch it right now, it will sensitize politicians and that will fail our project or, our, or what we have in mind. Okay, thank you very much. With that, we have to close. We're past our time already, but uh, I would take... Uh, uh, we, we should take the uh, Mr. Wembush's uh, advice on coming up with a strategic plan. We have covered and discovered a lot of issues today, but uh, we definitely need more comprehensive and in-depth analysis of those issues to be able to come with a full-fledged plan where to start this uh, venture. But I want to stress that Kamka is a very suitable uh, organization for taking this initiative forward. Thank you very much, everyone.